All right, we are live. Ethan, what's up, man? How are you? Good. How's it going, man? It's good to Great. see you. Great. Yeah, likewise. I like so the color of your shirt. Before we get started, I have two important questions, which, hold on, I think the producer is about to pop in. What's up, bro? <laughs> he's just like, he's <laughs> like, I'm just making sure you guys are finally getting to work. Yeah, here. making sure you guys are actually recording. All right, before we get started, I have two questions. First question. What's it feel like to be done with the hustle and with trends and HubSpot and closing the book on that important chapter of your life? Yeah, man. Uh, thanks for asking. It feels, I don't know. It's big. I, I guess I haven't really fully um, like embraced it yet. The yeah. hustle was like the longest job I've ever held. Um, and I am genuinely like it feels like the right move at the right time. And we found like a great person to run the newsletter. So I am genuinely excited about where it's headed. I, I have zero apprehension about what's going to happen there now that I'm gone. Um, And it just feels, it feels really good to be down to focusing on like one thing that I think is kind of the biggest for me. Um, yeah. Do you feel lighter? Oh yeah. Yeah. And yeah. this is, I, I still haven't sat down to write about this yet, but I really want to write something because I want to, I want to learn <clears throat> something from the last few months. I made a mistake and I, I haven't really thought through it yet, but it was like, I overcommitted and I found a threshold for myself somewhere. And it's, it's related to something like, I only have the capacity to focus on X number of things. And I'm not, I haven't even sat down to count how many things I was focused on. But they're virtually all gone now, except for this and Hampton. And so I really want to spend some time with that, just reflecting on it, because I don't want to go back there again in the future. I feel like, you know, as much like as much as I have enjoyed what I've been doing, I feel like my own ability to do it was compromised. I wasn't really bringing everything that I could to the table on all those things. And I really hated that feeling. Um, and so, yeah, man, it feels good to be down to like a normal number of things to focus on. I really got to spend some time with it to just reflect. I'm curious. Yeah. You got any, you got any, um, I've been slow to reflect on it. I think because I'm not even sure what questions to ask myself. Do you have any favorite sort of like journal exercises or prompts that you'll go through after kind of a major business transition? Yes. Uh, I wouldn't call it a, ma a major business transition. I would call it a reflection on threshold. And I think Maybe it was David Goggins, one of them like super alpha type videos that you see on, on YouTube shorts, right? Um, oh, no, it wasn't. It was E.T., the hip hop preacher, Eric Thomas. Um, he's not quite as famous, but he was somebody that I used to listen to like motivational tapes years and years ago. And he talked about you never know how far you can go until you go too far. And I do think it's important to go too far every once in a while, just to see what there is in you. And it's never sustainable. And I think we all know that. But most people don't actually have the courage to go too far to the point where they collapse and they look in the mirror and their face is drained. And they're like, I haven't had a <laughs> glass of water in like two and a half days, right? Um, I'm not advocating that kind of lifestyle. But but yeah, like the reflection that I do is, did I go too far? Did I have anything left in me? And usually it's no. And I think this is something that you and I relate to a lot, which is why I always um, uh, gravitate towards people who have a, pro a propensity for endurance and cardio. You know, you and I are like endurance and cardio guys. And I've always just noticed those personality traits to really coincide with those people that are willing to just go a little bit too far where they collapse at the finish line. And, and that's like the writing prompt that I give myself. That's interesting. Yeah. The ability, the ability to suffer. I put, I put um, a lot of value on that, I think, and not in like a hustle um, culture way, but I, I agree with you. I think there's this thing that happens when you uh, commit to more than you think you're capable of. Yeah. There, I, I, I'm reminded of a, a time um, when I was younger and I was going through a similar phase. 
And I remember thinking to myself, like, you never find peace in having less to do. Yep. For some reason, it only comes from like from these periods of like over committing and then coming back to normal. Yeah. You know, it's like, I think a lot of people, my, like for me, I fantasize a lot about, oh, I'll finally have the money and then I'll stop everything and I'll just like live on the beach. And I've gone through periods where I don't really have anything to do, uh, whether it's, you know, long backpacking trips or something like that. And the, like the mental clarity isn't really there. You know, it's like, it's very, it's, it's very jumbled actually. I think, cause I, when I have that free time, I start to think about, well, what should I be doing? And there's all these different options. Whereas when you're over committed, it's, there is a clarifying factor there where it's like nothing makes it through to your focus unless it's very important. Right. And in this case, I think I went a little bit too far. Cause I, I continually felt like if I pause to focus on one thing that was important, two other things that were important dropped. And so to me, that was like the threshold. It's not just about having too much to do. There's like a point at which I don't even have the ability to focus, to keep all the balls in here. Eventually. Yeah. But efficiency. yeah, yeah. But anyways, um, it was, it was helpful. I do want to sit down and reflect on it a little bit more and pull some like rules out of it for myself for the next time around, because I think, uh, it was just a, a, a useful part of my career, uh, mm. but it feels good, man. Thanks for asking. Absolutely. I'm happy to hear it. Congratulations on the success you've had the last couple of years and, and all you've learned. I'm, I'm pumped about that for you. Uh, second question. You launched Hampton. I saw Sam's announcement. Um, seemed like people enjoyed our podcast and us talking about it, but we didn't talk very much past the actual launch stage. So so how did it go? Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, it went really well. I was really inspired by the tweet that you sent about it. Um, <laughs> there's something about it that just spoke to me. <laughs> and for the people listening hey, who man, don't know. <laughs> you, ain't cheating, you ain't trying. <laughs> yeah. Tim, Tim plagiarized my tweet about the launch of Hampton. <laughs> So, um, no, it was great. It was, it, it worked really well, uh, we, way, uh, way more successful than I think any of us predicted. Wow. Um, I think heading into it, we were kind of under the assumption that we could expect, we were hoping to get like a thousand applications over the first couple of weeks. And I think we hit like 2,500 before lunch. Crazy. So yeah, just a huge, huge backlist. Um, and it went really well. So yeah, thank you. Speaking of launches though, I was scrolling through my brand new phone this morning, looking for your contact. Your I finally found it. Now that you've <laughs> upgraded your status by getting a blue phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Joining the real world with an iPhone. So I found your contact. I clicked on it. And the last text that I saw was you did this. <laughs> and it was you talking about the launch <laughs> of your own product, the bootstrapper, which you blame me for. How's things going? How's things going with that? Also good. Off to a good start. I 100% blame you, by the way. Absolutely. It's, <laughs> it's totally your fault. Um, really, what you did is you gave me the courage to do the thing that like, I've been wanting to do for a long time, but would find kind of easier, softer ways to do it. And, you know, I, I got to say, first off, to answer your question, the launch went great. I, I didn't launch it, so to speak, in terms of what we're talking about. I did more so kind of what we talked about last week, where I just pretended like it's been there the whole time and just eased it into my, my ecosystem. Uh, I have also been really surprised at the amount of subscribers that I got paid subscribers, mind you. So the bootstrapper.io, it's just on Substack. It's It's nothing groundbreaking, but it's a little bit more of an accessible product, an accessible front end paid product for the people that enter into my free newsletter. And so all I'm doing, it, it was math, ultimately, what, what it came down to. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I told you about how I had that Tim Urban ad. And it was that ad that really said, shit, I think I got to start doing two newsletters a week. And so I was, can but I, then can what, I pause you just to ask, uh, 
what about that ad made you decide to do two news two news two newsletters per week? Simply because I had the inventory. So I had Tim Urban doing who wanted four times a week, and then I had another ad that wanted four times a week on Friday. And so it was like, well, I guess I got to write two emails a week because I have the inventory for it. Four times a month. Oh yeah. Well, okay. no, twice a week. So every Tuesday and every Friday, eight times a month. I was doing four times a month. Got it. Got but it. then I doubled it. Um, and so a, a theme that comes up on the show a lot is how every business model has its pros and cons. And the pros of the ad model is that it's more easily accessible. Um, it allows you to not worry about customer service and, and product development. You just get to create the content. But one of the cons is that you're always having to hustle for the next one. You're always having to sell the next ad, right? So I'm basically booked out for one ad a week. And it was that Tuesday newsletter that was like, okay, well, I guess I got to add another one. But then of course what happens, I go through the Tim Urban ads and now they're not there anymore. And so it's like, do I keep doing a Tuesday newsletter just because I committed to doing it? Mm -hmm. And do I just assume that the ads are going to come in the future? And so ultimately it was a little bit of math where I said to myself, what's it going to take for a paid newsletter to quickly outscale what would happen if I was theoretically booked out on these Tuesday editions? And the, the, the math was pretty clear. Like if I stay consistent at the rate that I'm going within about six months, I'll be net green as opposed to what I would be if I just kept doing ads on the Tuesday net newsletter. Because remember, I still have the Friday newsletter, which is the main one. That's the one I've been publishing every week for a year and a half now. And so I have a cadence for that. I'm good. And it was also a little bit of a creative decision because the way I was making it different was that the Friday newsletter was a little bit more curated where there's the five sections and I post the podcast and I post the video that I do every week. Right. And then the Tuesday newsletter was kind of like a behind the scenes. Like, let me share with you what's going on in my business. And once again, Ethan, who continuously drops all of these like gems into my brain, when we were talking about in, I think it was two episodes ago, the difference between free and paid well, the free is like entertainment and personality and the paid is like education and how to. And so I'm like, well, why the hell am I giving away this shit for free on Tuesday when this is like the gold, you know, like this quite literally is, these are the buttons that I pushed. These are the steps that I took to get the results that I got. And it's very, very transparent. And so the, the workload hasn't changed. It's just the strategy has allowed me to have everything a little bit more neatly configured into I don't know what you would call it, not necessarily a category, but like the, the avenue that is best suited to it in terms of the product that it, that it wants to be. So long answer, it went great. Um, I already made uh, like 700 bucks off the first week. And what? yeah, and, and I think I'll probably get like one to two subscribers a week or so. So it'll, it'll move. Wait a second. Okay. I want to, I want to, I want to pause to just break down the numbers real quick. And then don't let me forget. I want to come back to this concept of having people pay for the gold because I really, I want to drive home why this is so important. The reason is that it's accessible to virtually anybody who runs a business or even if you have a job. So we'll come back to that in a second. But first, 700 bucks for just like making the thing available. And not yeah. even, you know, like super promoting it. Congratulations, first of all. Thank you. And can you just remind me? So, what does that represent, pricing wise? You're you're in front end price zone, right? So fifty to one hundred bucks a year, roughly. Yeah, that's correct. So one of the reasons why I, I basically had to have the courage to charge a lot more than what a typical Substack would be, and. I think a lot of people struggle with that. There was a Chris Ducker line where I heard years and years ago where he just said, take your price and then double it. Like the first price that comes to mind, just double it. And so that's what I did. And I made it, I, I wrote an actual sales page. So the sale is not, it's not just a typical sub stack where it's like, here's a free content. And if you want the paid one paid for it, you know, like it's, it's actually a sales funnel that goes through my personal email. So if you go to timstods.com, slash the dash bootstrapper dash special dash offer, 
that's the sales page that only the people that come through my newsletter see. So it's, it's pricing that is only for those people, right? Um, and so I, I wrote the sales letter. I put that together. I made it 150 a year for people that don't sign up to the newsletter. And then people that see the special offer, I made it 99 a year. Um, and so, yeah. And, and, and I just basically added it onto my newsletter as a section. So for people that don't read my newsletter, it, it might be kind of hard to picture, but my newsletter has five sections. The first section is basically like a 800 word blog post. It's whatever I'm talking about. Section two is the podcast. Section three is the ad. Section four is the video. And then section five is what I call a final thought. It's just like amusing. Um, but it was kind of perfect because what was happening is section one, which was like my free writing. And then section five always were kind of cross pollinating a little bit because there's only so many ideas I can have and experiences I can have each week. And so I was like, well, fuck it. Section five can be like a summary of what I talked about in the bootstrapper and then so have good. like, do you want to see more? Like, do you want to see the insights? Do you want to see the numbers? Click here to get full access to it. And it just came together, man. Like, honestly, it was, it was all of my success, Ethan, over the last year and a half is because of you. <laughs> Everything yeah. that I've done over the last year and a half has been stuff that I've learned from you. And I, I 100% mean that. Well, I appreciate it, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to deny that for one second. Just to point out a very important thing, which we've talked about on the show a couple of times, you could talk about the ideas all you want until you put them into practice. It doesn't mean anything. And your unique skill is that even when I try to slow you down, you're constantly <laughs> tinkering with stuff. So your your success is because of you. But I'm glad that some of the ideas that we've kind of like co-generated here that I've been able to share have been helpful. The yeah. thing about like, free newsletters being personality driven, we sort of co-created that, that, that arose out of that conversation. And yeah. I've been thinking a lot about that too. Me too. Um, yeah. And this concept too, this, I wanted to circle back on this, this thing about um, like selling the gold. So the reason I love this concept so much is that virtually anybody who is either running a business or in a job, I think has access to be able to do something like this. What we're talking about is packaging up the knowledge that makes you effective at your job at the important things too. Specifically, we're talking about like, how do you make money? How do you get more attention? Growth and monetization are like the two things people will continually pay to learn more about. For sure. Um, and so really whatever business you're running, I think there's an avenue to be like, I have a paid newsletter where I show you how I'm actually growing this business, which can be really interesting. I mean, I'm not sure every business needs that because some companies like media is tough on its own. If you're not like a natural writer, if you don't love writing, I don't necessarily think everybody should try to pursue that. But um, if you do love writing, there's a whole bunch of opportunities that come with just publishing on a regular basis, building this database of the different strategies that you're using to grow your company. And it just seems universally accessible. So I love I love that you're pulling the trigger on this. I hope people listening to this will think about it too. You don't need to go out and copy what somebody else is doing. Like as an example, uh, for the last few years, I worked for a company called Trends where we were a research company. So we would go out there, we'd research um different emerging business opportunities, and we would write about them. You don't have to go recreate trends just to come up with a paid newsletter. You can take a look at whatever industry you're in and just be like, here's how I ran my business this week. And, it, the, and if you get really nitty gritty with it, it's super valuable to other operators. You know, somebody who does this really well, uh, and we've had him on the show is Chris Orzakowski. If people haven't listened to this episode yet. I think the title is something like the email marketer who sends $129 a month paper newsletter. It's something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and he's so interesting. And by the way, that is exactly what he does. He he's an email copywriter and his company helps create email campaigns for a lot of different types of companies. Um, and then he's got this paid newsletter. That's more than a hundred dollars a month. It gets mailed to you in the, like, as a piece of paper. 
And he breaks down specifically like step by step some client project that he did that month. And if you just think about how valuable that is for other people in the industry, I mean, people are paying more than a thousand dollars a year to read this paper newsletter. What's the production cost on that? It's probably like, I don't know. He's probably 90% margin over the course yeah. of the year, you know? Um, and it all comes from just being very specific about what you're actually doing. Now that's the tricky part. That's the tricky part. Can you actually describe what you're doing in your business? Mm. Cause I think a lot of people have a hard time with that either, either because they're trying to like keep something secret or because they struggle to put themselves in the mind of the reader. And so they're not really sure like what's interesting, what's unclear. Um, and, but if you are somebody who can do that, there's huge potential there. Huge potential. It's, it's, hmm. I was having a conversation yesterday at a family barbecue and it was a lot of young families. And I was sitting down with this woman who had her daughter in her hand and she just started talking about education and how your, your brain starts doing things. When you have a kid, you think like, am I actually going to tell this person when they get older to take out $200,000 to invest in something that they could probably get online for free, right? And in my view, not in my view, in my experience, everything that I've learned about what I do has come from reading or listening to the experience of people that were a little bit of ahead of me, like everything, or even people that are a little bit behind me. I don't even know if that's like a good... Um, measuring stick uh, ahead or behind everybody has experience in, in different things and it's, it's it's weird sometimes and this was actually the subject of my newsletter this week because one of the things brian clark first taught me when he and i started actually talking like on the phone and building a relationship was you can't be afraid to repeat yourself because people there's always people that are hearing your message for the first time and i forget that and now it's getting to the point where my DMs are flooded every day with people like asking me for advice. And I'm thinking like, oh my God, like I am what Brian Clark was to me 10 years ago, you know? And it's just this <laughs> weird moment where like people actually are listening to me and like paying attention to what I say because they think they have something to learn from me. And I'm still in that beginner mindset where I'm looking around at other people thinking to myself, okay, what does this person have that I can learn from them? So I don't know if education is the word. Well, I, I guess it is. Maybe there's a difference between like school and education and, and education and learning. And then even more importantly, like learning and, and applying, right? But, but everything that I've learned has been from checking out someone else's experience and then try to apply it to what it is that I do. And that, that whole um, monologue, so to speak, is only to prove the point that th that within itself is proof that it's actually a business model, right? Mm -hmm. Like learning isn't any more about textbooks and tests and weekly reviews. Like learning now is about observing and then applying, observing and then applying over and over and over again. So I think it's probably like the most applicable business model that exists right now because, because everybody has something to share. This is kind of a side tangent, but I'm curious. How do you think about the whole college thing for your kids? You got two young kids now. Man, um, not good. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, not good. Yeah. And it, it's it's not a touchy subject by any means, but you know, like my I come from like an immigrant family, and that's the thing. Like, go to college and and be a whatever. And so my grandma still till this day asks me when I'm gonna gonna go to college. I just have, I wouldn't necessarily call it resentments. I just think the incentives for college are totally screwed up. And it's like so stacked on top of itself that mm -hmm. it's hard for me to see a way for the education to fix itself other than like imploding. You know, I, you ever seen the documentary, the ivory tower by any chance? No. Oh man. Check it out. Um, it's, it's it's like it shows the actual numbers about how screwed up the incentives are because colleges are incentivized to get kids to go there and they're not incentivized to get kids to learn. So what does that mean? It means $10 million rock walls and it means $40 million stadiums. And then who pays for that? 
the kids, the students. And then like, where does that tuition money go? Well, it doesn't actually go anywhere because it just has to, it like keeps one upping itself because as soon as somebody builds a $10 million rock wall, another college builds a $15 million like gym with like a VR arcade in it, you know? And so I think the incentives for college are really screwed up. And that's why I am actually optimistic about education in the future because I think it's going to get back to what it's meant to be, which is teaching people real world skills so they can use those skills to increase their income in society. I dig that. So if that's the case, how do you think about teaching uh, your kids to be learners? Like this has got to be something that you've thought about a lot because this is like a core part of your personality. What do you guys do to kind of facilitate that personality trait in them? And I know they're still really young, but has that started at all? Of course, just reading. Really, just read, read, read. Read everything you can. Read shit that you're interested in. Read shit that you're not interested in. Read every day. I don't, I don't know if there's a better piece of advice that exists in the world in, in terms of advancing yourself. You know, obviously, there's be like, oh, what do you... You say something like that, and then Twitter trolls are going to come at me, be like, oh, you're so stupid, Tim. You didn't even tell that person to like exercise. I'm like, I get it, (laughs) you know, right? But in terms of advancing yourself in a career or whatever, just read everything you can. Read every day, and magic will happen. I don't know how else to explain it. I like that as like a simple as a simple heuristic for, you know, here's here's what to do. So if that's the case, we talked a little bit about this. I don't know, compulsion that you have to learn from people around you. And you're in a unique spot because a lot of people are coming to you for advice now, but you're still in this beginner's mindset. Who who do you look around at and be like, that's the next, that's the next step on the ladder that I, you know, that's the person that I want to learn from next. Are there a couple of names that fall into that category for you? Like who's the Brian Clark for you today? That is such a good question. Um, <laughs> I'll give you a second to think it over too. And I'll, I'll, let me just riff on something related to this. One of the reasons that Ooh. I ask is that I realized something recently, which is that I'm not sure who my heroes are. And what I mean by that is like, I mean, if I was, if I had some time to sit down and think about it, I could probably come up with a list of a few, but if somebody was just to stop me on the street and be like, tell me who your heroes are, I wouldn't be able to tell them. And I think that's kind of an interesting uh, issue because you know you model the people that you look up to, and so if you're not really clear about who you're modeling, um, it's uh, difficult to kind of say with any certainty where you're headed and and what you're like going to achieve. And so one of the things that I'm thinking about more this year than I have before is just like who who are your heroes? And specifically for me, I'm trying to find like more. Um, like male role models to look up to. I I mean, I was always really lucky. My father's an incredible man, taught me a lot about what it means to be a man. And I had a great, great influence there growing up. Same thing with my grandfathers and stuff. Um, But like outside of that family circle, I'm not sure who else I really look to as a, uh, a role model. And I'm at a stage in my life now too, where I think a lot of people, if you're, they could, you could just stop right? Like no one's pushing me to grow. No one's pushing me to get better. Mm. Um, You could just stop. So I've been thinking more and more about this, like just purposefully sort of cultivating the idea of who are your heroes? Who do you look up to? Uh, So yeah, given the way you think about learning, are there any names that come, come to your mind right now? Like who, who's kind of the next person you're modeling right now? There's two different ways for me to answer this. I'm, I'm in a point in my life well, I'm, I'm kind of similar to you. I, I, there's nobody I can think of right now that I'm looking up to thinking I'm going to imitate that person because everybody wants to be like the visionary, right? And, and trot on their own path. But that's not actually whatever happens. All of us are mimetic and we're all imitating somebody that, that we look up to. Um, so nobody in that sense. And, you know, it's, 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to try not to tangent too much or remind me to come back to point two, but it's really, really interesting because I've been journaling all week about this uh, every day where like it feels uncomfortable and also a little bit liberating to know that I am really like on my own path right now for the first time, like all the decisions I'm making, I'm making because like I feel like they're the best decisions to make as opposed to being like, oh, well, this person did it this way. So let me just do it that way as well. And so that's a little bit different. Um, I think it's growth and it's also uncomfortable. Hmm. And it's just so interesting that you asked me that because as we were talking before we started recording about like uh, where we're going to take the, the direction of the show, one of the things that I thought about saying is some of these journal prompts about how I'm feeling like a little insecure about the fact that I'm actually the one like steering my own life right now. <laughs> and like that's supposed to be a good thing, I think, right? <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's, it's messing me up. Um, in terms of the model, and God, this like, this is painful to say, just because this keeps popping up on the show, and maybe it is a little bit of like hero worship, and I need to self reflect on it. But but Vaynerchuk's model, like, is he understands that it's not. He understands that the only thing that can never be commoditized is what people pay attention to. And I, I have huge differences of opinion in terms of investing in what those things are, which I've talked about before. Like, I don't think investing in social media brands makes a lot of sense, both from just how the, the numbers back out, like what attention on social media is actually worth like dollar for dollar. I think there's other things to do, which are more like lucrative attention. Right. But, um, the thing that I do model from him is he's built a service nucleus, basically he, he's built a nucleus. He's built a conglomerate of media brands that are all um, dependent on maybe it's kind of like the the what do you call it in a wheel where like all the spokes go into the wheel and then there's that one little circle in the middle you know yeah. like that circle in the middle of the wheel is his service company is his agency and then his agency is basically like leverage and labor and um uh, and capital to invest in other pockets of media until the whole entire thing builds on itself. So if you have like 10 different media companies, it's not as though the value of the thing is times 10, is one company times 10. It like a hundred X's because the all of the attention like just snowballs and compounds. And that's always been the model I'm going for. I just, I'm just doing it in a way where I'm, more so interested in like in-depth content where I assume that people are smarter and more willing to absorb information than I think the rest of the media world is. That's really interesting. There's two things that come to mind for me about that. One related to the sort of hub and spoke model you and I. Uh, thank you. I could not. I could not think of the word. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Well, three, two and a half years at HubSpot, so comes to <laughs> <laughs> comes to mind pretty quickly. Sure. <laughs> um, I've been I've been uh quietly like celebrating a little bit because a lot of the bigger creators out there are starting to talk publicly about something you and I've been talking about for a while which is this concept of owning your own products. And that's really what you're talking about with Vayner. So that hub of his services, like all the other products, and they're able to be more successful because this central hub, it has the labor and it has the distribution to make all these other products successful on their own. Exactly. And this is something that Sean Purry's talked about recently on My First Million. This is something that Pomp, Anthony Pompliano, recently restructured his entire business about or around. So all those guys are operating, I think, at like higher level than what we're currently doing. But the we were early on the realization. So it's like this whole concept of the ad-driven creator model is fine. But if you can own the product and you own, you know, like the service and distribution related to all those 
uh, external products, it, the, the compounding effect of that over time is just way more powerful. And so we called this months ago. We said more and more creators are going to start moving in this direction where they own the product that they advertise on their own shows. And now you're seeing it at the highest levels too, which is really, really cool. The other thing, um, oh, I forgot the other thing. But anyways, it was cool. The other thing will come back to me in a minute or so. But the it, it's been cool to see uh, people do that. Oh, now the other thing is back. So I was, I'm always surprised to hear you say Vayner because I feel like one of the hallmarks of your work that stands out to the people who know you is that you're like incredibly balanced uh, in your personal life. And I'm like, I also have a ton of respect for Gary and I don't actually know what his personal life is, but he doesn't strike me as somebody, he strikes me as somebody who's kind of always on, always working. I think he loves it. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems to me like you are much more oriented toward like, why am I working? I'm working because I want to be able to earn money, to spend time with my family, all that kind of thing. And you've always been very good about continuing to make time for it. So as you talk through the way you're like structuring your content, I feel like that's not necessarily a reflection of, uh, just your belief in terms of like what people pay attention to. It also feels like a reflection of what your goals are as the producer of the content. Cause it's like, you're not really in this game for the quick hit of attention. And even if, even if I was to come to you and be like, I can make you 10 times more money, but it's going to mean that you got to record like 60, 30 second videos a day. You'd probably be like, get the fuck out of here. I don't want to, I know that die. sounds miserable. <laughs> I would yeah. die. So there's an interesting thing there about how like the business that you build, I, I think it's great to have heroes. And it what you're showing me is that it's possible to have heroes who don't necessarily operate the way that you would want to operate mm -hmm. too. Like they're, you don't have to carry over everything from them. But the business that you build really has to reflect the type of life that you want. And I've always really admired your ability to live it's almost like the it's like your like the your day-to-day -day life is the goal. And then you kind of back out from there to figure Makes out sense. how to run the business. And I like I try to I try to do the same thing when I think about it. Cause I'm I'm my impulse is usually just to work. That's certainly my impulse as well. And I, I think one of the things that people don't see as much from me is how restless I actually am like inside my head. Um, my, my family jokes about it sometimes as well, because I'm, I have a really, really good ability to stay cool under pressure. It's probably one of the biggest reasons why I'm CEO, right? Like bad shit always happens and I've, I never panic. And so people think that I have this very calm and cool um what's the word where you're not redlining it um just steady right some a steady demeanor about it but but i cannot stop thinking about stuff like i really cannot shut my brain off and it's uh it's hard man it really is it's a it's a challenge to to continuously prune all of like the hedges that are growing in a million different directions. <laughs> the, the hedges is an, an analogy for my brain, by the way, for my <laughs> thoughts. Um, but you know, that that's something that I genuinely believe is a skill. And it's something that I think takes like active work. You can't just hope that one day you can have better control of your thoughts and of your mind. You have to like actively be working to learn how to control your thoughts and to control your mind. So I say that as a realization, like, yes, thank you for the compliments. I, I'm happy that the honest reflection of myself is being exuded into the world. It makes me feel good that like, I actually am the thing that people think that I am, right? Like I'm not giving off a, a fake persona by any means, but if there is a part of this whole game for me, which might be unrecognized, it's that. Uh, is that I have a ton of restlessness. 
mm. all the time. As soon as I wake up in the morning, man, I cannot tell you, like, as soon as I wake up in the morning, I am fucking out of bed and I'm straight downstairs and I'm writing down in my notebook and I'm staring out the wall and I'm thinking of the things that I got to do for the day. And I'm thinking of all the things that I'm not doing good enough. And I'm thinking of all the opportunities that I'm not taking advantage of. It's, it's, it's exhausting, man, for real. It really is. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that makes sense too. That's, and a lot of people listening to this will probably relate to that. It seems to be a very common personality trait. Totally. I'm glad you brought that up too. There's, I'm, I'm reading an interesting book. I just started it, but it's on the concept of shadow work. Has this ever come up for you? No, I have no idea what that means. Um, so I'm still so new to it. I'd be hesitant to try and even explain like what it definitely means, but here's what Would it you means say shadow me. work, shadow work. Okay. So it's sort of like a branch of Carl Jung's philosophy. And, um, from what I've understood so far, he, he would kind of explain it like this. He says, when you're born, you're born pure, right? Like Christians might say something like, you know, like it's, it's almost like you're born in the garden of Eden, right? You don't, mm -hmm. you have no concept of good and evil, right or wrong, anything like that. And then gradually you sort of get socialized into culture and culture teaches you certain things are acceptable and certain things aren't. And the things that are acceptable become part of your public persona. And then the things that aren't become the part shadow. of your shadow. Yeah. And there's like this really interesting concept too, where it's like, if you think of cultural acceptability as being a mark on a line, everything below that becomes part of your shadow. Sure. Which people wouldn't be surprised to hear, but here's the interesting thing. Everything above it becomes part of your shadow too. So if there are parts of you that are like better than the, what is expected in terms of society, a lot of times that gets pushed out of whatever your kind of personality is too, because mm -hmm. you don't want to stray too far outside of this box of like, here's what's socially acceptable. And the concept of shadow work is this idea that like, it's, it's healthy and normal to have a shadow. Your shadow is supposed to balance whatever your persona is. And it's healthy and normal that cultures demand this of you, right? There would be no civilization if just everything was constantly socially acceptable. So, but where we go wrong is that the two of those should be balanced, right? So whatever you have going on over here in your persona, you need to be actively aware of and kind of embrace the shadow part of yourself as well. And what's very common is that people just bury the shadow and they totally. and like our perception of what's good in culture is that like, I don't know, we'll, we'll just say like, you're a nice person. Okay, great. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, exactly. Where people go wrong, and I feel like I relate to this, is you kind of say, okay, well, then I'm only going to focus on being a nice person, right? And you kind of ignore all the other parts of yourself that might look at something and be like, well, that's dumb, right? Or that guy's an idiot. If those thoughts come up. That's that shadow part. And in order to stay balanced, you need to be aware of both of them. They need to balance each other. So my understanding of it so far is that like shadow work is about just kind of getting back in touch with the other parts of yourself that um, I, I guess would be like on the left side of that equation. And uh, it's super interesting, but you mentioned this thing about like the constantly active mind, right? Which I think, and that might be one example. I think some people are probably rewarded for that publicly, but there are these things that like as a founder, you're not rewarded for and that you i think they you do kind of pull them back and perhaps they become part of this shadow if you buy into this like philosophy um and so it's, it's just interesting to hear people talk about them because i think it's so important to acknowledge that they do exist right you, you, even if even if publicly you are calm cool and collected you are aware of the shadow part that is like this constantly running loop of uh questions thoughts inadequacies stuff like that and because you're aware of it it doesn't spin out of control right that's what it means to keep those two sides balanced but it's so important to acknowledge because without acknowledging that like if you're if the people that you look up to never acknowledge the fact that they deal with those things mm. like everybody who looks up to them buries those traits in themselves and then it becomes a problem so yeah. 
I just thought it was cool that you acknowledged that, but also it reminded me of this book that I'm getting into. And I don't know why I was so, I had a, I'm fascinated by this topic right now. Um, it came up at a founder dinner that I was at and it was just so, I think it was like, it was so interesting to hear everybody's experience with it. Um, and I had just never, never heard of the concept before. So, uh, it's interesting that it came up here too. Yeah. It reminds me a lot about a poem. Uh, what's her name? Marianne. Hold on a second. I got to find out this woman's name. It is. Okay. Wait, here she is. Uh, Marianne Williamson. That's right. I'm, I'm sure you've heard it before. It's like pretty common. Uh, well, I don't know. I'll just read like the first sentence of it because it's something that I think about a lot. I never heard it like in Jungian terms, um, in terms of of the shadow, but it really is a an awareness of suppressing the good and the bad things about you because you're insecure about the fact that those bad and good things will have an impact on people to make them feel insecure. So the poem is called our, our great, our deepest fear, I think maybe is our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous. Um, and then it's the end line of it that always sucks with me. Um, Oh, no, no, here it is. Okay. This is the important part. At least I think. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightening about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are, uh, yeah, that, that's the line wow. that always really, really kills me because that that happens to me a lot. Like, I hate the feeling of like I'm bragging or of being in a conversation and, and talking to people about like what I do or maybe some of my accomplishments and you can see them kind of shrug their shoulders and, and wither down a little bit. And so I have to remind myself that the shadow isn't just the, the things that I want to hide from the world. The shadow is also the things that I'm, I'm purposely hiding from the world because like I don't want them to think I'm better than them, but there's nothing enlightening about that there's nothing serving me or serving the world about like dimming down my light right and so i i love that man that's that's like a really cool way to to summarize the fact that what we all should be doing most is trying to make the most of ourselves for both ourselves and for the world because there's nothing in it for anybody about just being okay with the way things are Right. And maybe that's toxic masculinity or whatever the new buzz phrase is, but whatever, man, I, I'm out here trying to live. I think that's awesome. That might be a great place to wrap this too. What a cool lesson there. There's I, what is it? There's nothing noble no, about playing Marianne, it small. Marianne Williamson. Um, you're, you're playing, there is nothing enlightening about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. Oh, wrecks me every time. I like, there you go, it really, people. really wrecks me every time. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Make sure you don't mute your colors out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> play it big. And we will see you next week. Thanks for checking this out. Uh, be sure to check out copybloggerpod.com. And we're out of here. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week.